Welcome to Hear the Word of God, the online and broadcast teaching ministry of the Rev. Eric Alexander. Now, Revelation chapter 4 brings us in a very real way to a new beginning in our study of Revelation. Indeed, somebody said to me not too long ago, when are we going to start Revelation proper? Uh, by which they were implying that the letters to the seven churches were not revelation proper. Of course they are, but you can understand what they meant. What they meant was that the real substance of the book of Revelation uh, is often thought to begin here. The link uh, with chapters 1 and 3 is, of course, very important Chapter 1 is the general introduction which sets the scene for the whole book. That book, as I said at the beginning, you may recollect, uh, is several times uh, described as three kinds of book in one. It has three literary characteristics. It is, first of all, revelation. And at the very beginning, in chapter 1, verse 1, this is how it is described, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. It is, therefore, an unveiling, and that, of course, is what revelation means. It is an eye-opener. We are taken behind the scenes, as it were, to see the reality of what God is doing in history. Secondly, it is described as a letter. And you see that not just in chapters 2 and 3 where there are actual letters to the seven churches, but where in chapter 1, verse 11, uh, the living Christ says, write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, and then names them. So the book of Revelation, in its entirety, is a letter as well as a revelation. The third title that we saw you would need to give to this particular piece of literature is that it is a prophecy. And in chapter 1, verse 3, um, the Apostle says, Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it. Now, therefore, the book of Revelation is to be understood as a prophecy in the way that we would think of other biblical prophecy. Uh, I think that in chapters 1 to 3, we've been very conscious of the first Two of these characteristics in chapter 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ in his glory is set before us in language which is designed to bring us to see that there is something surpassingly wonderful, blindingly glorious about the Lord Jesus Christ. From verse 12 of chapter 1, you get this picture of Jesus. His face, for example, is burning and shining like the sun. He is dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his head, his chest, his head and hair, white like wool, as white as snow, his eyes blazing like fire, and so on. This is a revelation of Jesus Christ in his exalted glory. And of course the people in this particular generation, the suffering church who were John's compatriots, they greatly needed this picture. Not so much now of Christ in his humiliation as of Christ in his exaltation. And that's one of the great messages of the book of Revelation. So we saw that in chapter 1. Then in chapters 2 and 3, we have seen the characteristic of the letters addressed to these seven churches. 
It is in so many ways obvious from this that uh, what John is writing is not just a revelation of Christ in his glory for all generations, but a specific address to these churches in Asia that uh, we have been looking at over seven weeks altogether. And uh, there is this characteristic of an address to these particular people. Through them, of course, we see the church in every generation. But there is no question that it is an address, first of all, to these particular churches who are John's contemporaries. But now in chapter 4, the book continues to be a revelation and a letter addressed to the churches, but it is increasingly also a prophecy. And this is what we begin to come to as chapter 4 starts. Now, we do need to stop for a moment at this point, I think, especially because we are starting this new section, and ask what kind of prophecy is this book of Revelation? Or what do we mean when we say revelation is a prophecy? What does the apostle John mean when he says, blessed are those who read this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it? Well, what does he mean by a prophecy? I think I probably ought to give you some idea of the four answers to that question that have been given over the years as people have sought to interpret the book of Revelation. Let me try to tell you what they are. First of all, some think that this book of Revelation, the whole of the rest of it, is an utterance only to John's own day. That is to his own contemporaries in first century Christendom. And there are many people who have said, this is the significance of the book of Revelation. It is addressed to the suffering, perplexed, and persecuted church of the first century A.D. And uh, the significance of its message is that it is addressed to them. Now, that has the merit of making the book relevant to John's own contemporaries, but it has the demerit of making it irrelevant to everybody else. If it is addressed only to his contemporaries, it is not in the same sense directly addressed to those who came after them. So, it would be an important thing to see the problems of that particular kind of interpretation. For those of you who are interested in the word, uh, the word that's used for that kind of interpretation of revelation is preterist. If you're not interested in that, forget it. Uh, I'll put it down in the piece of paper uh, next time we study revelation. The second uh, attitude to the prophecy of revelation is that many people think It refers to the whole of history from the first century A.D. onwards until the coming of Christ. The problem is that it would not be of great help if that were its implication for those who lived in John's own day. Most of it would then be concerned with the future. So that, for example, one way people interpret the letters to the seven churches is that they think that the first church at Ephesus is one age, the age immediately after the first century. The next letter is another age of the church going right through seven ages of the church. Now, that's been an interpretation of the book of Revelation. It is often called the historicist approach. The third way of understanding the prophecy of Revelation is to think that it refers entirely to the last days at the end of time and history, to the period immediately before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And there are some people who study the book of Revelation and say it refers entirely to this last period immediately before Christ returns. Now, you can see, of course, that that would make it of great importance for understanding the last times. But it would not be of immediate significance for people either in John's day or in our day. That approach is often called the futurist approach. So, you've got the preterist, the historicist, and the futurist approach. The last one, you'll be glad to know, is a rather simpler uh, word to describe it. It is the idea that many people have that Revelation does not, in fact, deal with facts at all that it is not dealing with history at all. It is only dealing with ideas and principles, and it's concerned neither with John's contemporaries or his successors or with the end of time, but with principles through which God works. And you can see these principles at work in all sorts of different ways. Now, uh, of course, what that does is to secure the permanence of the relevance of revelation for every age, but it does destroy the historical basis that John is referring to when he writes about things that are going to come to pass and so on. It seems to me that when you, that that view is called the idealist view of revelation, but It seems to me that none of these four approaches to the interpretation of Revelation is by itself satisfactory. And I think that the best way to approach the book of Revelation is by taking this word that John himself uses, the idea of prophecy, and saying the best way of approaching Revelation is the way that you would approach prophecy in general. Now, if you think of our last study, which was in the prophecy of Isaiah, you will see, if you think of it for a moment, that all of these four approaches are covered in the interpretation of a prophecy like Isaiah. For example, you get the present-day relevance, where when Isaiah is prophesying, we found in Isaiah that again and again he is addressing his contemporaries. Of course he is speaking about their present situation, their disobedience to God, and so on, their trust in Egypt instead of in the living God. He addresses their present situation. Certainly he addresses the end of time. He speaks about the ultimate day of God's judgment. He brings before them with vivid reality how God is one day going to have a day of justice and a day of reckoning and a day when he will bring his people into the full fruits of their salvation. So you find he speaks about the present day, about the ultimate future day. You can also see in Isaiah's prophecy, as we found again and again, that there are whole historical perspectives that he is speaking about, how God works through the whole of history. And from Isaiah's message, you get this fourth emphasis, that he has principles and ideals which are the basic principles on which God works through all of history. So it seems to me that you need all four of these approaches if we are adequately going to understand the book of Revelation. The idea of true prophecy embraces all of them. Now, the prophetic message in Revelation, therefore covers all of these things. If we look at the book of Revelation and imagine that all that we have to do is work out a plan or a series of numbers or whatever that are going to help us to understand a timetable for the end of the age, then we are looking at it the wrong way. 
because the book of Revelation was in the first place designed to encourage and bless and help beleaguered Christians who were suffering persecution under the Roman Empire. And it's very important for us that we do not exclude that and concentrate on the end of the age. You will know that there are many groups and sects which have landed in all sorts of trouble because they have isolated their interest in Revelation. Jehovah's Witnesses is one of these, for instance. And there are many other ways in which this kind of isolation of certain interests in Revelation have produced all kinds of misunderstanding. You will notice how uh, the idea of uh, Revelation applies in chapter 4. For the revelation here is a revelation of the church and the world from the vantage point of the throne of God. Now, this is the central feature of the revelation that John is given at the beginning of chapter 4. After that, this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And what happened when the voice spoke to him was that he said to him, Come up here, he said. Come up here, and there is something I have to show you. Now, you know how we say that sort of thing. If you are climbing, and those of you who have done some mountain climbing, unlike me, will know the sort of thing that happens. You may say to a friend, come up here. Come to you see this, because there is a vantage point from which you see the situation in a way that you never would further down or at ground level. And this is exactly the idea that lies behind what John is experiencing. The voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet, that is in chapter 1, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Now, when he went up there and was in the Spirit... That is, this was some spiritual visionary experience he had. There before me was a throne in heaven. Now that picture of a throne, I say, is a central picture in Revelation. You can see that even from the vocabulary of Revelation. The word throne occurs in the New Testament, I think, something like 62 times. And 47 of these occurrences are in the book of Revelation. Now, that's a matter of great significance, that there is this dominance in the book of Revelation of the idea of the throne of God. And see, that is what John is told. The throne is not empty. The throne is occupied. There before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. Now he begins to describe the someone who is sitting on it and clearly what he is attempting to describe is the indescribable. He is going to tell us it is God who is sitting on the throne. But you can see how vital that is for people in all kinds of conditions, weakened by opposition deserted so often by their friends, denied their pastors because of the persecution of the Roman Empire, and finding themselves increasingly discouraged and perplexed, they looked out on the ancient world. What did they see? They saw a society which was becoming increasingly sick. That society in the first century, you know, those of you who have ever been at Pompeii, and have seen some of the things that are inscribed on in the walls of Pompeii, you will see that in the early centuries after Christ, the Roman Empire was morally rotten. There was something that was utterly sick about Roman society, about the morality of it. That was what was increasingly invading the ancient world. And the decline and fall of the Roman Empire began, of course, with inner rottenness. It was a violent society, too. 
That ancient society was one where some of the most horrendous things were perpetrated upon Christians and upon others. Life was cheap. Violence was regular. And it was also an extraordinarily confused society. A society which had no sense of direction which was turning here and there for some substitute for the vacuum in their lives that godlessness made. Now that, of course, is exactly the situation into which these people in the first century came. And it doesn't take much imagination to see the parallel in our own times. A desperately morally sick society a desperately, dangerously violent society. And I I was uh, in Toronto for only a week, and somebody said to me, I think on the Thursday evening, uh, that's the ninth murder this week in eastern Toronto. Now, that's happening, of course, in our own society. Those of you who are doctors will know something of what this means in in casualty uh, admission places in our own Glasgow hospitals. We live in an extraordinarily violent society. You ask Hugh McKenna about this sort of thing down in in the center of the city. And we live in an uncommonly confused society. Society in the ancient world that desperately lacked leadership, incidentally, with five emperors in one year. And you can see the parallel in our own time. Now there was a church which correspondingly was oppressed and persecuted, which in places had compromised and become unfaithful, which was indifferent in so many areas. You can sense all this from the letters to the seven churches. Now, many would be asking, who is in control in this extraordinary world? That's a question which again and again people are asking in our own generation. Is there someone somewhere in control in this crazy, sick world in which we live. Now, this is the point of that vision that John is given being taken up and a door is opened into heaven. Come up and I will show you something, he says. And what he shows him, and this is the perspective from which he is to see the future, there was a throne and someone was on the throne. Now, notice how he uh, describes him. Let me just uh, try to outline this for you. The vision was, of course, a vision of God, and it was a vision of God, first of all, in his sovereignty. There was God sitting upon this throne in heaven, and this was a vision, not of things as they would be, but of things as they really are. God is on the throne in heaven and is presiding over the affairs of men and nations. His long-suffering and patience with rebellious men and women is not to be mistaken for weakness. And his sovereign sitting upon the throne, is the central fact of life. Now, for the believer, that has to become increasingly so. This is to be something that has to be at the center of our vision. He is a God whose sovereignty is, first of all, set before us. But you notice the second thing in verse 3 that is set before us is, what you would call God's inscrutability, his immensity, and his inscrutability. That is, it is possible to be told and made aware 
and even to see in this vision that God is on the throne, but to understand him, to fathom him for mortal men and women is an impossibility. And the result is that you get God described as the flashing light from some precious stone. Now, the reason for that symbolism is not that God is attempting or John is attempting either to make it difficult for us to understand. He is bearing witness to the inscrutability of God. You will remember how, uh, and, and this passage incidentally owes a great deal to two prophecies. One is the prophecy of Ezekiel and the other is the prophecy of Isaiah. In Ezekiel chapter 1, you discover that the picture is very similar to this picture. Uh, if you want to listen to it or if you have your Bible handy at Ezekiel 1, listen to what uh, he says. Um, he describes in Ezekiel 1.10 the figures that John describes in Revelation 4 that are surrounding the throne. Each of the four had the face of a man, and on the right side the face of a lion, and on the left side the face of an ox. Each also had the face of an eagle. Now, if you look over in uh, Revelation 4, 7, the first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. But the whole picture owes its origin to this vision of Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 1. And the whole idea of Ezekiel's vision is he keeps, if you read it later on, tripping out phrases like, it had the appearance of a likeness of, or it was like unto the appearance of, and he is searching for some way that he can describe what he has been shown of God. And the fact is that it defies him. Because although we may know God, we cannot ever fathom God. Now, there's an important distinction there, you see. There are many people who talk about the ways of God with them in their daily life as though you could fathom God. I still remember very well somebody who had gone through a very trying and diff difficult experience was at when I was a student. And there was an elderly man who came up from uh, the InterVarsity Fellowship in London. And as we were talking, he was describing this mysterious, painful, difficult experience he had gone through. And he said, I do not understand God's ways. And the elderly clergyman, turned to him and put his hand on his shoulder and said, that's not really too surprising, is it, when you think of it? And it's not, is it? Because God is inscrutable, although we may know him as our father and love him as our friend and serve him as our master, we will never fathom his nature and being, his wisdom and his ways, his plans and his purposes. And we dare not pretend that we can. So he says the one who sat there, verse 3, at the appearance of jasper and carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald. Now, I can't even describe the rainbow, do you notice? It resembled an emerald and encircled the throne. So there is this picture of God's m immensity and inscrutability. Notice in the third place, there is not only his sovereignty and his inscrutability, there is a picture of his majesty in verse 5. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. Now, if you know the book of Exodus chapter 19, you will know that that's exactly where that comes from. Because it is the picture of Mount Sinai. And the presence of God on Mount Sinai in his majesty and righteousness and glory was that 
there was thunder and lightning. Now, again, do you see, this is how God communicated himself. They could know him and know his law as Moses brought it down from Sinai. But they could not fathom him. It was like thunder and lightning and the fearsome majesty of these things is meant to bring home to them something of God's majesty. Notice in verse 8, there is his holiness and his eternity. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around. That is, they saw everything everywhere, even under his wings, day and night. They never stopped saying, now where do you remember reading this before? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Of course, it's in Isaiah chapter 6. And just as you get this vision in Ezekiel, you get this vision of the angelic beings in Isaiah, and they're crying exactly the same thing. Now, the simple truth of this is, you see, Scripture speaks with one voice. And this is where John is finding the background for so much of his picture of the throne of God and the glory of God, which Isaiah saw in his time. His holiness then, but also his eternity. Notice in verse 9, whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever. Then the 24 elders fall down before him and so on. Uh, the, one, two, three, four, f- the fifth thing is his power and glory. Notice in verse 11. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, Here they are worshipping. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. There is the power of God then. Now, can you see how these poor, needy believers in John's generation desperately needed this? To whom does ultimate power belong? That's the great question. I don't know if you had it in in the papers here, but the Toronto Globe and Mail had, uh, on the day that President Clinton was uh, inaugurated, installed, or whatever they do with presidents, they had the pictures of five men. And beneath these pictures, five international statesmen. One was John Major, another was Boris Yeltsin, and i uh, forgotten who the other was, but Bill Clinton was one of them. And uh, they said, here are the men who control the world's destiny. And I thought, God help us. If you really believe that, you know, if you really believe these are the five men who control the world's destiny. Now, in scriptural terms, you see, That is a dreadful heresy. Because ultimate authority does not rest on their shoulders. Ultimate authority rests on the shoulders of him to whom belongs power and ultimate glory. Now, that's what these people in John's generation needed. That's what believers who are conscious of their weakness, who are aware of the powers of a secular society who are aware of the powers of darkness in the world in which they live. That's what they need to grasp. Where does ultimate power reside? And the answer is it resides at the throne of God. Well, now, what are God's people to do in this situation? Well, you see the significance of this. There are two groups of people in uh, verse 4 there is a group of 24 crowned figures seated on thrones surrounding the throne. Now, there is, there is great debate about who they are intended to represent. Some think 
they are intended to represent uh, the whole of God's people down through the whole of history, Old and New Testaments, the twelve tribes of Israel and the twelve apostles. That's the twenty-four. Some people think that that is true. Uh, it may well be that it refers to God's people. I just don't know, and I don't think any of us really knows. But they are dressed in white. They had crowns of gold on their heads, and from the throne there came these flashes of lightning. But notice um, there is also another group in uh, verse 6, halfway through, in the center around the throne were four living creatures, and we saw that these are pictured also in Ezekiel. They were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox, uh, like a lion for strength, some say, like an ox for service, the face like a man, for wisdom, the fourth was like a flying eagle for speed. Now, uh, I don't know if that's uh, what they're intended to represent. It may be these are angelic creatures. It may be they are messengers of God uh, waiting to go out and do His will. But I tell you the thing that is more important than anything else, and it's this, that in heaven, every other occupant of heaven besides him who is on the throne is engaged in worship. They are engaged in magnifying his name, in having him at the center of the whole of life. And their worship is the exaltation of His name. They are absorbed with Him. They are taken up with Him. I was saying to the ministers who met with us in Toronto that I think this may be the reason that the one thing the non-Christian world cannot fathom about the Christian is when the Christian is at worship. They will understand perfectly well your Christianity related to other people in service, and indeed they will expect that you will exercise your Christian living in that realm. They will expect that you will exercise your Christian living and standards in relation to yourself in self-discipline, and they will accuse and chastise you if you're not consistent there, because Christianity is understandable in these two dimensions, you see, in relation to other people and in relation to yourself. The one thing that the godless cannot begin to understand is the Christian at worship, for this reason, that in worship he is totally taken up with God. And the idea of a human being being absorbed with God defies his understanding. But that is what these people reveal to us. This is what heaven is like, beloved. It is absorption with the glory and majesty and greatness and power and beauty and love of God in His grace. And the only person they want to exalt is Him. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Now, as God prepares us for heaven, my dear friends, He is preparing us to be increasingly taken up with the same thing that what we are really interested in is exalting His name. That's the point of these 24 creatures laying their crowns before His throne. You, you notice they do that. Now, the idea behind it is very simple. When a minor dignitary came 
to uh, pay obeisance to a superior sovereign. He would take the crown from his head and put it down at the throne of the superior sovereign. I'm told that in Malaysia, do you know that in Malaysia there are nine sultans and one king? And when the sultans choose a king, which they do periodically, one of them mounts a superior throne, and the others submit to him by bringing their crowns and laying them at his feet. Now, God has raised us to amazing dignity in Jesus Christ. He has made us kings and priests unto God. But the whole point of our life is for us to take our crowns and lay them at his throne. That we shall do one day in glory but it is to be done symbolically with our lives here in this world. And so there is a vision of a throne and of someone sitting on the throne and of the whole of God's people and all creation worshipping before the throne of God. And so we may say to one another, Rejoice! The Lord is King. Whatever the appearance to the contrary may be, the Lord is King. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word. We bless you for the revelation of your glory and majesty in this book. Help us to understand it, we pray, in these weeks to come. Give us light and wisdom, and grant above all that it may transform our lives. For the glory and praise of your name we ask it, as we commit one another to your fatherly, gracious, loving, and personal care. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You're listening to Hear the Word of God with the Rev. Eric Alexander, a minister in the Church of Scotland for over 50 years. To access more Bible teaching from Rev. Alexander, visit hearthewordofgod.org, where your generous contribution will help us sustain and grow this ministry. That's hearthewordofgod.org. You could choose instead to mail a check to this address, 600 Eden Road, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, 17601, or call 1-800-488-1888. This program is a presentation of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. I'm Mark Daniels. Thank you for listening. Please join us again next time for Eric Alexander and Hear the Word of God. <laughs>